A welcome to the first of a number of events under the banner of Noisy Thinking, which uh, we are pleased to have sponsored by our friends at Flamingo. Uh, I should introduce myself to begin with because this is my first big event like this as the new chair of the APG. And one of the great things about coming in as the chair of the APG is that you get to take the credit for the best ideas of the outgoing chair, of which this is one. Um, so, as Sarah Newman was finishing her chairship of the APG, uh, one of the uh, legacies that she has left for me is the concept of creating a little bit more noise around planning and creating a little bit more debate about what planning is, what planning should be, where it's going. And to try and make that debate not the usual kind of uh, semantic, introspective, what's a planner anyway and why don't we get the credit for what we do, but to make it a little bit more of a... Sorry, I've gone to spoil someone's talk there, haven't I? Um, try and make it a little bit bigger than that. Try and make it a sense of what this discipline can offer, uh, not only to advertising communication, but to the broader business world as well because we bring some skills that can be very useful uh, to many businesses going forward. Um, so we have uh, three fantastic speakers with us this evening. Uh, the way the former format is going to work is it is now about 10 past 7, and we will be in here chatting until around about 8.30. Uh, I will introduce all the speakers to begin with and then each of them will have around about 15 or 20 minutes to make their uh, presentation on the topic. And then after all three presentations, we will open things up for questions from the floor. There'll be a couple of people with microphones running up and down, so if you have a question in that section at the end, raise your hand, a microphone will appear, and then you'll be able to make yourself heard. Um, so the first Noisy Thinking event is really focused on planners or ex-planners talking about planning. We will have future events where clients will share their perspectives, and we will also have other events where we'll be talking about the global perspective, but this is the real kind of kickoff with the heart of the matter, which is planners' views on where planning is nowadays. So three speakers uh, who will very pleasingly speak in alphabetical order of their first names, which I, which I did find very satisfying. Um, first of all, we're going to get uh, Adam Morgan, uh, who should really need no introduction. Uh, of course, devised, created, and runs his own company, uh, Eat Big Fish and really was the man who pretty much invented the concept of challenger brands through his book, Eating the Big Fish, subsequently The Pirate Inside, and a new book to come out, which he may tell us about later on if he's looking to get you all to buy it. Uh, I'm sure he's allowed to make that. Um, so welcome, Adam. Uh, then we will have uh, Cameron Saunders, who rather remarkably is a planner who is now a managing director, which gives us hope for all of us that our skills are transferable. Um, so he spent quite a little while at WCRS before he was enticed to go and work for Channel 4. And most recently, he is now managing director of Fox Broadcast UK. Fox Films, Fox Films UK, I knew I'd get that wrong. Uh, so welcome, Cameron. Uh, and finally, Richard Huntington, who is currently the uh, Director of Strategy at Saatchi & Saatchi in London, uh, and also an ex-chair of the APG, and friend of the APG in general, one of the judges on the uh, APG Creative Planning Awards this last time around, and of course, uh, a famous blogger at uh, his blog, Ad Literate, uh, which you can all take a look at after this. So, uh, without further ado, I will hand over first to Adam to take you through uh, his particular noisy thinking on this topic. Thank you. Um, I, um, by way of context, uh, I was a planner for between 82 and 99. I still sort of think that being a planner is like being an alcoholic. You always are, even if you've stopped. And um, so I still will talk about we as a planning community, even though you might say I haven't theoretically belonged to that for quite a while. Uh, what I do now is, is workshop-based um, projects with clients where I try and swim upstream. So I try and include uh, marketing and communications work, but very often it's with cross-functional uh, client teams looking at kind of bigger business problems. And that's very much the perspective I'm bringing to this particular conversation. Um, so I'd just like to start off by a little kind of auditory cue. And, and I'd like us to keep really, really quiet and see if you can hear something. OK, so I'm thinking you probably can't hear that. So I'm going to ask just the audio to be played now for five seconds. Or not. No. So, so what it was supposed to be was <laughs> a very amplified sound of some teeth being ground 
what you're supposed to be hearing is the sound of my teeth grinding. Uh, and I'm a pretty quiet and passive teeth grinder most of the time, but there are some things that really get on my chops, and this is one of them. This is a study, you might have seen this, is a study produced by IBM Solutions, essentially a management consultancy, on the future of marketing and the future of the CMO. And this is really irritating for a number of reasons. One is, it's the future of marketing and the CMO produced by a bunch of um, quite kind of logical, rational strategists who are selling quite expensive products and have nothing to do with advertising and wouldn't recognize a good idea if you hit them on the nose. That is really irritating. The second thing that's really irritating about it is, actually, the R&D they've done is pretty impressive. 1,743 face-to-face -face interviews with CMOs in 64 geographies across 19 categories. That demands a certain kind of CMO to take it quite seriously. They have, if you download and read the report, they've got three key uh, um, conclusions, none of which relate directly to advertising communications or ideas. So what I find really annoying as a planner about this is here's a very authoritative piece of work being presented as a very authoritative piece of work on the future of marketing and the future of the CMO that marginalizes advertising and planning in two different ways. One is it doesn't really mention communications as being central to the kind of a changing agendas on a, on a CMO's um, plate. And secondly, actually, it's come from a completely different place than, than your industry. And of course, it's not the only person to do that, is it? You know, here are these people um, talking again in a way that owns a conversation that is certainly happening within the planning community and the strategic community, but not something that we are taking to clients in anything like a noisy enough way. And as a result, they do a very authoritative report, and it's passed on, and people read it, and all that kind of stuff. Again, people from outside the industry writing very definitive books that people like Reckitt Benkiza are taking very, very seriously. Where are planners here? Well, they are here from time to time, and they are here in very good places. And of course, this particular thing is one of the most important bits of work on marketing in the last 25, possibly 50 years. But I wonder if enough of our clients know about it. And I wonder if we even marketed that well enough. And actually, only one of the two people who wrote it is still in an advertising agency. So my question for us as a planning community is, where the hell are we? I think we're having really brilliant, really interesting conversations between ourselves when the industry and the future of marketing and, yes, however you define marketing in the future, needs us to engage much more vigorously and be much more authoritative about what's going to happen in the future and the part that our unique skills have to play. And I'm not seeing or hearing those nearly loudly enough from where I'm standing, much more in the kind of client camp. Two things shocked me about um, advertising and ideas when I left the business in 99. One was I didn't really notice ads. I was astonished. I'd spent my life, I'd started as a planner at BMP, and in those days we had to do all our own groups. I literally did 110 groups in my first year as a planner at BMP, 80 of them on lager, 55 of them on a beer called Hofmeister. I really knew the George the Bear consumer really, really well. And when I used to do the warm up in the groups, and you say to consumers, OK, so what ads have you seen recently? And they go, oh, I don't know, really. Um, you'd get really annoyed. You'd think this is some pose for the benefit of the rest of the group. Of course you've seen bloody ads. You've been watching TV five hours a day. That's why you were recruited. It says so on the form. <laughs> but actually, people don't notice ads that much, of course. And we all know that, right? They notice the really, really good stuff, and most of it is just dross they don't see at all. But the second thing that really shocked me was how small the amount of mental space advertising and the development of advertising occupied in the average CMO's mind. Because naturally, when you're in an agency, you sort of think that basically the CMO's diary consists of you know, meeting with advertising agency, waiting for advertising agency to phone me, looking forward to lunch invitation from advertising agency. You're going to go through the week, and most of it centers around us. And of course, it doesn't. Right? It didn't in 99, and it's even less. We're becoming marginalized more and more because there are all these other ways in which they're supposed to engage with consumers and create content and do all these other kinds of things that they're supposed to do now. So the amount of mental space that we are taking up in the CMO's mind is getting smaller and smaller. And other people are setting the agenda for what they should be thinking about. You can't allow those two things to happen and have a healthy and vibrant business going forward. It's just not going to happen. We're really good at solving our clients' strategic problems. We're really crap at solving our own. 
And it's time we thought about having a much more rigorous strategic approach to the value and the power of planning and the value and the power of what we represent as an industry in our clients' futures. This is a piece of film. It's quite difficult to get clients to talk about this, you know, because clearly they have an existing agency and they don't want to sh put a piece of film in front of a bunch of planners which, which slags off their agency. For some reason, they think that might be prejudicial to the relationship. And you can sort of see why. So I tried to find um, clients who, who weren't CMOs anymore. Um, and here's a piece of film of a guy called Pierre Schaefer, who was in marketing at Apple. Um, he was global CMO of Kodak Digital between 2000 and 2005 and took Kodak cameras to market leader in the United States during that period of time and then became CMO of Michelin globally out of France. So, and here he is talking about some things I've just been talking about, but with a charming French accent. Can we roll that? Oh, hang on, I just click on it. Don't I? Yeah. The role of the modern CMO is morphing to the point where communication and promotion represent only a fraction of what they orchestrate on a daily basis. Upstream, they help guide the work of research and development. Downstream, they make sure that the proper customer experience is implemented. All of this because marketing today is not just about what you communicate anymore, but it's also about what you actually deliver in the market. And in that context, it's really surprising to see that you still have many agencies who just focus on solving the communication problem of their customers without taking their broader business issues in consideration. For decades, the marketing world has been on autopilot. And we all know that today it's at the point of major inflection. Marketing is clearly in flux to an extent that has problem, probably not been seen since the arrival of mainstream TV. And you have to wonder, where is the authoritative voice of the agencies? Why is it that all the reports about the future of marketing come from consulting companies like McKinsey or Forrester, or even more recently, companies like IBM? It really feels like many agencies have been caught by surprise and have not invested enough in the future of marketing, in marketing research and development. Uh, I have no idea why the sound quality is so crap. Um, now, the thing about this is that, of course, some people are investing in it. Some people are uh, standing up and taking a position. I think the media companies are really interesting in this regard. So this is a guy called Mark Holden, who is the global strategy director of PhD, the media company, standing up on the main stage at Cannes last year. The main stage at Cannes uh, seats um, 4,000 people. Um, half clients, half agency. Um, other s speakers on the main stage at Cannes included, of course, people like Robert Redford, um, Patti Smith, a whole bunch of other people. He filled that audience talking about the future, the changing media landscape and the changes that would necessitate for clients and for um, media companies. And he talked about what those changes might be. He owned that audience talking about the future of his sector. They did an app um, which had a series of interviews, some R&D, effectively, they'd done around it. Uh, there were 10,000 people who went to Cannes. 5,000 of that audience downloaded that app. So there is a company that is standing up and talking about, there is a business that is standing up and talking about it. But I'm not seeing us do that. And I wonder why not. And of course, it wasn't always like this. And at this point, I sort of, you know, we get dewy-eyed with nostalgia. And you think, oh, bloody hell, Adam has been around far too long. The world's changed. But what's interesting, clearly, if we were working on a brand, if we were looking at the brand as planning, we'd go back to the history of the brand. And we'd dig around, and we'd dust off its archaeology, right? And what we'd find out about this brand is when it started, it was started by two agencies and two people, Stanley Pollitt at BMP, Stephen King at JWT. And Stephen King at JWT, his interest was what he called grand strategy, not ad tweaking. He made a distinction, unfairly, I think, between BMP and JWT in that regard, but <laughs> as an ex-member of BMP. But nevertheless, he made that distinction. And I think the challenge is a really good one, because when I started at BMP and I learned about brands, the article I was given to read about brands, the articles I was given, were written by JWT planning directors. They'd invested in that time and in those people and in that R&D to be the authorities, not on the future of ads, but on how brands worked and what the relationships were and how you influence those relationships. And I'm not seeing any of us stand up and take that position anymore, invest that time in doing it. Now, 
there are two ways you can take what I'm saying, right? One is, one is you can say, so what? So what? That can't be wrong, can it? You know, you know, one billion in 2011, who cares? You know, we're up 20%. Yeah, OK, that's fine. And that's across a wide variety of different businesses again. And we're seeing a you know, fragmentation of businesses doing and answering um, what the consumer, what the, what the CMO is doing. The CMO of one of my clients in America has 148 different agencies serving his brand. And his ambition is to get it down to 56. He doesn't think he can get it down any smaller than that. That's what's going on. Do we want to be one of those 56? I don't think so. The other way you can see it is, yes, this is quite dangerous. If we are being marginalized in this kind of way, at some point, at some point in the future, planning will end up like the kicker in an American football team. You won't be part of the big ebb and flow of the game itself. It will be a specialist who's brought on for a very specific event at a very specific point in that game. And will be very handsomely rewarded, and we'll have American kickers events and all that kind of stuff. But we won't be part of the bigger offensive or defensive agenda. And I think that would be a shame, because clearly, we've got a lot to offer, right? I, you know, hey, all of you will write a different list of what's brilliant about planning and what it has to offer, but that ability to have a really rigorous, rigorous and stimulating question hierarchy, starting upstream and moving downstream, the ability to kind of just be really creatively curious and look in places that nobody else is looking and, and combine that logic and magic, all those different things that we think make planning special and exciting, that has a much bigger place at a much bigger table if we allow it to have. But we've got to create the place for it to stand to have that influence. And we're not doing that at the moment. We're just not. And the competition is shocking here. I, yeah, I'm going to get shot for this if McKinsey gets to see this. But I mean, McKinsey, I've done work and I've seen you know, McKinsey and, and some of these, their kind of, kind of confederates in, in that kind of management consulting world doing big strategic projects just wouldn't recognize a really good creative consumer strategy for them in the nose. So it's not like it's being ha happily serviced elsewhere. It's not. Actually, the business needs us. But we're just not stepping up. Um, so what are we going to do? OK. Um, hey, I mean, you could write this as well as I could. I think we need to move from, as Pierre says, thinking about communications problems to constantly thinking about and understanding and putting ourselves in a position to understand and frame the business problem with and for our clients. I see too many uh, planners being apostles of the new, um, chasing the new thing, chasing the exciting thing, whereas actually what our ambition should be is to be the big, best strategic problem solvers that a client has available. I think we spend too much time talking brilliantly to, our, to each other, and I say we, talking brilliantly to each other, whereas actually it's about choosing our audience. We want to be authorities within the marketing and the CMO community. We need to pay much, much more attention to that audience and to that group of people. That's where we need to be noisy. Instead of just randomly browsing and sharing, we need a much more disciplined R&D in ourselves and in our companies. Um, and instead of being here talking to ourselves, one of you needs to be on the main stage at Cannes talking about the future of marketing based on some R&D you, the APG and the agency has done. That's where you need to be. That's what the KPI is. I'd like to read about planning in the FT. Where is that? Now, you might say, easy for you to say, Adam. Easy for you to leave the business, come along, give us a bit of grief over a couple of beers in the bottom of the Welcome Foundation. But actually, the, my business model is set up because of my frustration in advertising agencies' failure to invest in R&D. So for instance, I wrote a book, um, as uh, Craig was saying, in, in 1997. I took six months sabbatical to do that. Uh, it sold quite a lot of copies. I have still to make up in book sales the revenue I lost from sacrificing my salary to write that book. Um, 12 years later, and I've done two editions. I still haven't made that up. But of course, that's not the reason you write a book. You write a book because you want to create a brand selling products and a premium brand selling premium products. I'm trying to write a third book at the moment called The Beautiful Constraint. That is a really expensive thing for me to do. If I take three months out of my business next year to write that book as one of five key people generating the leads and pulling in the business, that's a big financial hit for us to take. But that's our R&D. That's how we sustain our authority in a very, everybody talks about challenges now. When I started talking about challenges, nobody talked about it. Now, you get three million hits uh, when you Google challenger brands. Lots of people are talking about it. If I want to sustain that authority, I have to continue to invest in it. We do a lot of stuff on the site. We do videos. We go out and do videos. I've got a full-time videographer. We're in a small company of 15. That's a very expensive proposition. But that's our R&D. 
We've got a guy who's just written an app. I encourage all of you to download it, please. It might justify the expense. That's our <laughs> R&D. So I'm not advocating anything I don't do or practice myself. The average British company invests, I think, 4 or 5% in R&D. But are agencies really doing that? Is planning really doing that? I don't think so. So what's my four-point agenda for planning? My four-point agenda for planning is this. First of all, start grinding your bloody teeth. Don't take this lying down. Don't be happy playing the smaller game. There are two games. You're brilliantly playing the smaller game. There's a bigger game to be played. Start wanting to play that bigger game. Want to influence the, want to influence the perceived value of planning and agencies in that bigger game. Secondly, so where does that start? Raise your own game first, right? Develop a higher level of expertise yourself. Move beyond being just a stimulating but anecdotal apostle of the new. So you're going to have to have your own R&D and a focus less on other planners and what the other people in this room think, and much more on the client community and what they think, and what's central to them and how you can be useful and helpful in, in what they're doing, and their annual operating plan, for instance. Third, develop a much higher level of expertise within the company. You're going to need to develop the ability for them to do R&D. They won't have budgets to just lash around, so you need to find quite creative ways to do that. But you need to be the architects of that change within the communications business, rather than simply brilliant participants of it. Help reinvent that business model. Drive it. And finally, obviously, market planning and the value of agencies as brilliantly as you help clients market their own businesses. The business needs it, and actually our clients need it. They're just not able to see the real and whole value that we could offer. That's my shtick. I'm going to hand over to Cameron, because Cameron is a really interesting example of a brilliant planner um, who's gone into two different client businesses and is going to talk a little bit, I think, about the value and perspective that he's found um, his planning background can bring to that. Thank you for that introduction, Adam. Thank you for um, inviting me and hosting here today. It's, it's a great honor to be. I've, I've admired Adam's work for quite a long time on Challenger Brands and working with him on Orange and Channel 4 and uh, Richard from um, Fresh Meat of the last um, Battle of Brig Brains um, event. So uh, it's, it's, also it's great to be back in planning. I think as Adam said, you, uh, I spent a decade working and planning at WCRS, um, it's certainly my formative years, and I had a fantastic time working with some really great, interesting, stimulating people, working on probably 15, 16 different brands over that period of time. And it's, 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 you know, it's an absolute right being a planner, and I, think I envy you to some extent, because it's, it's great being in planning, and it's a great stimulating time, and I think there's lots of changes ahead, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a great business to be in, and I still see myself, it says planner turned businessman, as where well. I'm some sort of turned coach. But I think in my heart I'm sort of planner, um, and that's what I want to talk to you about is what I've learned from my own experience in planning and how I've, I've applied that to being pretty successful. I think you know, I'm a managing director of 20th Century Fox, the biggest film company in the UK. I had a great time at Channel 4. I've, 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 I've learned a lot from planning, but haven't really um, left a folder, hopefully. Um, well, the first thing I did in any presentation um, is do a Google search. And that's quite pleasing. It's a Google whack, Adam told me. It's, there's, there's no results found for planet and businessmen. Um, not a single one, apparently. I think, to some extent, it's, it's, you know, the definition of planner and the definition of businessman are equally vague. So I remember when I first started planning, my um, mother-in-law described me as being a nice young man from accounts, um, <laughs> which says a lot about most people's understanding of you know, people don't remember advertising, let alone understand what the hell planners do in the, in the world, in, in the real world. Um, that's not to say people in accounts and I, you know, running a business, the, the account people are very important, the accounts guys are very important. Without them, no one gets paid. But planner and businessman as well. Pla businessman sounds like something that Alan Sugar talks about. It sounds like a guy in a pinstripe suit and who kind of talks money and all that kind of stuff. And to me, the reason why I went into planning was because I didn't want to be a businessman. That's one thing I knew when I was at university. I didn't want to wear a suit. I didn't want to go and work for McKinsey's or investment banks like all my friends were going to. Advertising, I actually went for a presentation by uh, Will Collin, who was at DDB at the time. And he talked about planning. And I was like, I've never heard of planning, but that sounds like a great, what a great job. It's understanding consumers and understanding people and how that works. And for me, from there, I fell in love with planning straight away from that, from that brief. So. Um, yeah, I think the kind of planner businessman is a kind of a quite tricky one, but um, I mean, I now there is actually now a result for planner businessman, which is 
which, which is me, and so I can, I can give, there's, there's, I am the only planet in a Google universe who's turned businessman. So, and for me, what, I, what I'll talk about really is, is a very personal perspective of, and I'll talk a lot about my own prejudices, my own shortcomings, perhaps, apply to planning, and I can't, you know, planning is such a diverse spectrum of people, it's really hard to work out what planning is. I have, in a way, some things are planning and that prove useful for me, and I think now, um, I'm managing director of Fox, but I think as a planner, I, I think I'm now a better planner than I was when I was actually a planner, just from what I've learned. Whether it's a maturity, whether it's, it's, it's some other things which I'll, which I'll talk about, actually, the, I think the, the planning I do now at that, in, in a specific to, to Fox is, is, is better perhaps than I was doing when I was in, in advertising. But I thought I'd shape this presentation around, if I was in the audience, um, what kind of questions would, would, I, would I want to ask myself? This is slightly rhetorical, and so to speak to myself. But I'll start it with the first question, which I guess you might want to go, what's it like being um, on the client side? And there's lots of different clients. What's it like? What do I actually do? What's my job entail? And what are the similarities with, with being a planner? And I guess the first thing is, I have a team of 50 people uh, in, in the UK across sales. In a way, we're, we are a film distribution company, so we, the films are made in LA, they come across to the UK, and my job and my company's job is to take those films, make them as successful as possible in the box office by being like promotions, premieres, talent tours, paid for advertising, media booking, selling it into cinemas, and then making sure we get as much revenue from the cinema chains, we maximize the value of the film across home entertainment or platforms. So I have a team of people um, um, who, 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 work, who work for me. So, and in a way, as with being a planner, I spend pretty much most of my time listening to people. It's kind of, I listen to people's aspirations, frustrations, ambitions, thoughts, and ideas, and be like, um, head of publicity, head of promotions, be like a, a marketing assistant, be like the, the agency. A lot of what I talk, what I do is actually spend, in a way, there's a collection of people who actually deliver the value of 20th Century Fox. As, as, as a senior manager of a company, in a way, my, the important role I play is, is listening to their aspirations, finding out what they want to achieve, and then how can I help them do that? Because if they achieve greatness, that's what makes a company successful. So, Again, similar to, to, to being a planner, I spend a lot of my time talking about what's possible. So we do 20 to 30 films a year at Fox, be it Big Bomber's House one day, Black Swan the next, Tree of Life, um, Avatar. You have a whole range of films, which can be a really small film appealing to a very small audience. It can be a mega blockbuster. It can be a kid's film. So every film has possibility. Every brand we launch, like the brands um, in, in advertising, every brand has is, is born with possibility. And, and in a way, a big part of what I do is, is trying to identify what is possible and identify, get those people who work for me to identify what's possible. How can you look at things differently? Um, bring in outside perspectives. Again, what's unique, in a way, being at Channel 4 was, um, a lot of people at Channel 4 were advertising backgrounds, so you kind of felt at home. Channel 4 wasn't a big move, for, um, in a way, for me, because Channel 4 was like, working in advertising agency, so I'll talk about it in a second, but at Fox, I'm, I think, the only person at 20th Century Fox who hasn't spent 10, 15 years in the film business. So you have a bunch of people who are, know the film business inside out, no more than I'll ever know about film, but they have a certain set view on how films are launched, how films are positioned, how audiences behave, how advertising works, which is ingrained in, in, in how, they've, how they've kind of their experience. And a big part of, of me as an outsider, in a way, and I was brought in as an outsider, Kind of TV, sorry, TV and film are kind of similar in many ways, but you know, I am an outsider, so I bring a fresh perspective. And a lot of that is is getting people to look at things differently. So my team um, get them to look at things differently. Every now and again, I do a kick-ass presentation to LA. I'm going out next week to present to the, the studio chairman, and I become a salesman for the day. And a big part of that is as much selling the, the work my team does, because I need my team to be, to be, I want my team to get promoted, to be rewarded, to feel like you know, actually they're progressing. And a big part of it as, as, as the MD is, is really about nurturing your team and making them look good. And my, my, my job when I'm in LA is, is, is to showcase the great work the team does, show why Fox is the best in the business. So, and that's why I quite, I, I quite enjoy that. I don't do it as much in, as a client, you don't often present. You can find yourself at Channel 4. I didn't do a presentation really for a couple of years because Channel 4 doesn't, is not the kind of business that presents to each other. I actually quite like being a planner. It was quite fun standing up for the first time, doing stuff which I hated. I was, I was painfully shy when I was um, a student coming into to an advertising agency and being forced to push out to present your strategy. And I'm like, Jesus, terrifying. But actually, you end up quite enjoying doing it. it, it it's like, in a way, I think most planners are in, in a certain way a bit introvert and don't necessarily feel more comfortable. They feel more comfortable 
going away having her own thoughts, but presenting is a big part of, of uh, and persuasive language is a big part of the job. And that's, I, I kind of enjoy that. It's good being a salesman. 